and to have 10 or 15 minutes for, for questions. And you should know that a couple of weeks ago, I gave a considerably longer version of this presentation to several hundred lawyers down in New Orleans. And I'm not watering down the talk for you at all. I am just making it shorter and covering fewer cases. And the subjects of these cases range from child pornography through gun control, employment, voting, uh, international law, and even including at the very end uh, some discussion of uh, free speech and the Establishment Clause, uh, in particular the Ten Commandments, uh, as we shall see. Let me say a little bit about what we're going to be uh, uh, doing today in the format. I chose these cases in particular for their educational uh, purposes. I also will, before each case, I will give you some uh, background, some doctrinal and contextual background so you understand what the Supreme Court uh, has done and what its significance is in a particular case. I want to say a few words at the outset about the 2007 term, which is the last term. We are now in the 2008 term. In the 2007 term, there were 67 merits opinions after argument, including two summary reversals and two affirmances by an equally divided court. This is the lowest number of Supreme Court opinions since the 1953 term, over 50 years. Rather remarkable. 14% uh, of these <coughs> decisions, of these opinions, came from the Ninth Circuit, which I often refer to as the circuit the Supreme Court loves to hate. But this is down, actually, from the 2006 term when 29% of the court's cases came from the Ninth Circuit. Uh, not atypically, eight of the ten cases from the Ninth Circuit this past term were reversed uh, or vacated. There were 14 fully unanimous decisions, 20% of the uh, court's uh, overall uh, decisions as w total decisions. And there were 46 or 66% uh, reversed or vacated in the Supreme Court this term. Of particular interest to those of us who watch the court, there were 12 5 to 4 decisions. 17% of the court's decisions this past term, in other words, were 5 to 4 decisions. And in eight of these, Kennedy, Justice Kennedy cast the decisive vote where there was an ideological split. A split. Last term, amazingly enough, he cast 19 of 24. He wrote, uh, or he cast a decisive vote in 19 of 24, 5 to 4 decisions. He also wrote the opinion uh, in four of the 12 merits opinions. No other justice wrote more than two of those. So Kennedy, is still the go-to justice on the Supreme Court. You always, when you write a, a cert petition, write a brief, argue before the court, you're trying to get Justice Kennedy uh, on your side. Let's start off now with the first of these uh, cases, and that's the United States versus Williams First Amendment and Child Pornography case. It's a Scalia opinion. It's seven to two with Souter and Ginsburg uh, dissenting. Here's the background. Obscenity is unprotected by the First Amendment. It's outside of the coverage of the First Amendment altogether. In contrast, pornography, which doesn't necessarily have to be obscene, pornography is protected by the First Amendment unless it is child pornography, as the Supreme Court held way back in 1982 in the Ferber case. What is child pornography? It is sexually explicit visual uh, portrayals uh, featuring children. Now, not surprisingly, there have been various congressional attempts uh, for the last 10, 15 years to deal with child pornography. And all of these, until this most recent decision that I'll tell you about, have been struck down as un constitutional, primarily as facially uh, overbroad, 
Uh, these uh, congressional attempts that have been struck down include uh, statutes covering virtual child pornography, not involving the use of actual children. What Congress did in response to these slaps uh, by the Supreme Court was uh, enact a statute uh, called Prosecutorial Remedies and Other Tools to End the Exploitation of Children Act, called the PROTECT Act of 2003. And what they did, what Congress did was intriguing. What it did was prohibit pandering and, or solicitation of child pornography through interstate commerce, including the mails and computers. And it was applicable, the statute was applicable to material that reflects the belief or is intended to cause another to believe that the material contains visual depictions of minors engaged in sexually explicit conduct. Note that. This is a congressional uh, attempt uh, to, uh, Congress was concerned, let me put it this way, Congress was concerned with limiting criminal prohibitions to materials uh, that could be proved to be child pornography. If Congress did it that way, it would enable many people to evade conviction because of the difficulties of proof. Here, specifically in this case, the defendant posted a message on a public interest chat room saying that he had pictures of actual children engaged uh, in sexual conduct, and he provided a hyperlink to it. He also said that he had had sexual relations with his young daughter as well. He raised a challenge to the statute, to his conviction, as overbroad. Even though the statute clearly covered him, he argued that it covered other protected expression, and therefore it was overbroad. And when a plaintiff, when a person is successful with an overbreath challenge, that means the statute can't be enforced against anybody. He argued that the statute, as I said, uh, covered a substantial amount of protected speech. Supreme Court held, as I said, 7 to 2, Scalia opinion, that this statute was constitutional and not substantially overbroad. It was directed at pandering. It had uh, specific requirements of scienter. It was transactional. The word belief uh, had both subjective and objective elements. The definition of sexually explicit conduct tracked the Ferber decision. And here is the key. Offers to provide or requests to obtain Child pornography are categorically excluded from First Amendment protection, which means we don't use any kind of heightened scrutiny, whatever. Certainly not strict uh, scrutiny. We had a couple of concurring justices, uh, Stevens and Breyer, uh, emphasizing the act was limited to pandering uh, and uh, lascivious purposes. Souter and Ginsburg dissented. They argue that the statute was unconstitutionally overbroad because it covered proposals, if you will, where there was no proof that actual children were involved. And they also argued, for those of you who know a little something about the First Amendment, that this statute was inconsistent with Brandenburg and the clear and present danger test because under that latter approach, you must focus on a realistic, factual assessment of the harm and not on what the speaker thinks about the speech. One concluding observation, as I mentioned earlier, and it's important to keep this in mind, this is a First Amendment overbreath case where a defendant engages in hardcore conduct that is unprotected by the First Amendment but he argues chilling effect because of overbreath. It has been decades since the United States Supreme Court uh, has ruled in favor of such a defendant. Decades in a criminal case. So this is part of that uh, kind of background. Now, a case which is uh, not at all controversial. District of Columbia versus Heller the gun control case. 
it has been almost 220 years since the founding of our nation under our Constitution, and it's been almost 70 years since the Supreme Court's decision in the United States versus Miller, which declared pretty emphatically, at least most of us thought it did, that the Second Amendment's purposes were military in nature. Remember the Second Amendment's uh, language. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Question, is this individual or is it collective? In June 2008, the Supreme Court held for the first time in the Heller case that the Second Amendment protects an individual's right to possess a handgun in his home for self-defense purposes, what the court called the core of the Second Amendment. Dick Heller was a special police officer authorized to carry a handgun while on duty at the Federal Judicial Center in DC. However, he was refused a registration certificate for a handgun that he wanted to keep at home because DC law generally prohibited the possession of handguns and also did not allow for their registration. Moreover, residents had to keep any, un any lawfully owned firearms, such as registered long guns, disassembled unless used for law lawful recreational purposes. Heller challenged these prohibitions and won on the Supreme Court five to four, Opinion by Scalia, separate dissents by Stevens and Breyer. All these opinions were unusually long ones for reasons I will get into in a moment. In the court's view, the district's flat out prohibition on handguns in the home for self-defense violated the Second Amendment. Now Heller is in large measure, although not solely, an originalist battle over history as to the meaning of the words of the Second Amendment and its prefatory and operative clauses, which I quoted earlier. Addressed by all of the justices were, count them now, English history, contemporaneous statements about the right to bear arms, state constitutions of the founding era, post-ratification commentary, pre-Civil War case law, post-Civil War legislation, and post-Civil War commentator. And I couldn't think as I read the opinion, couldn't help pitying the poor law clerks who had all of these materials for their bosses. Now the majority and the dissenters read these historical materials very differently, with the majority separating the prefatory clause from the operative clause, analyzing the operative clause first, which is significant in and of uh, itself, and the operative clause uh, is, of course, uh, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. The majority uh, analyzed that first, while the dissenters read these two clauses together, analyzing the prefatory clause first, which seems more natural because it appears first. In any event, from a non-historian law professor's perspective, in other words, one who has not gone back to study the historical materials, all of them himself, the majority and dissenters, in my view, fought to a draw. Neither had a slam dunk. There is much more to Heller than a dispute as to original intent and the interpretation of historical materials, though. The majority downplayed that, 19, that 1939 Miller decision that I mentioned as one that was distinguishable because it involved short barrel shotguns. In fact, the majority, interestingly enough, actually disparaged that Miller case as not engaging in a thorough Second Amendment analysis because the government's brief in Miller was sketchy and the defendant did not even make an appearance. Those of you con law buffs who remember Marbury v. Madison know that the Jefferson administration did not make an appearance in Marbury v. Madison uh, either. The majority was constrained to do this in order to avoid overruling Miller or at least its military-based reasoning explicitly. In contrast, the dissenters made a stare decisis respect for precedent argument and they maintained that Miller was still good law, that the courts in the country had long relied on Miller's reading of the Second Amendment as dealing with the military use of firearms. Heller is both pathbreaking and narrow at this point. It is pathbreaking in that for the first time ever the court declared the Second Amendment creates an individual right to possess a gun at home for self-defense. 
It is narrow in that it specifically lists various limits on this right by simply asserting the following with little or no reasoning. The right does not extend to concealed weapons. It does not uproot long-standing prohibitions on the possession of firearms by felons or the mentally ill. Prohibitions against carrying weapons in sensitive places such as schools and government are constitutional. The right does not render unconstitutional government imposition of conditions and qualifications on the commercial sale of arms. The right does not extend to dangerous or unusual weapons, those not in common use at the end of the 18th century. Pretty clearly, uh, these statements, these qualifications, these limitations were intended to assuage public opinion and also to head off Second Amendment claims that might be based uh, uh, on those kinds of situations. Heller leaves several important legal issues open. First, it leaves the incorporation question open, which some of you may know is currently before the Seventh Circuit. Seventh Circuit held in 1982 in a case involving Hoffman Estates that indeed the Second Amendment does not apply to the states. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with incorporation, it simply is the doctrine that applies through the 14th Amendment, various provisions of the Bill of Rights to the states. So the Heller case involved the District of Columbia, which is not a state, and therefore Heller on its face applies only to the federal government and to the District of Columbia. So the incorporation question is going to be uh, a very important one. There are various hints in Justice Scalia's opinion uh, that, in fact, this will be incorporated, and I don't think I need those hints. The Second Amendment, in my view, will almost certainly be incorporated because this Supreme Court has not come this far just to be stopped by incorporation with respect to the Second Amendment. Heller also leaves open the all-important standard of review question. Uh, we all know that it's not enough to talk about a constitutional right. What is at least as important is to address what the standard of review is. Is a rational basis most deferential at one extreme? Is it strict scrutiny or per se invalid at the other extreme? All we know from sure about the Second Amendment, uh, we know this from the debate between Justices Scalia and Breyer, that it, the standard is not rational basis and it is not ad hoc balancing. My guess is that the standard is going to be something like intermediate level scrutiny, which requires an important governmental interest. That's easy. The saving of lives for gun control is an easy, uh, easily important uh, governmental interest. And then the substantial relation to that interest, uh, the means and relation, and that's going to be particularly important for licensing requirements there is inevitably going to be a great deal of litigation over the scope and applicability of, of Heller. Keep in mind that government resources are required to fight challenges to various gun laws. There's also the factor of attorney's fees under Section 1988. There might even be the prospect of damages liability under Section 1983 uh, for local governments and for state and local government officials who enforce a gun control statute or ordinance that turns out to be unconstitutional. Heller is only the beginning. It will take years to determine its scope and impact. In that sense, it's very much like Roe v. Wade, where it's taken decades to figure out the scope of the right of a woman to terminate her pregnancy. <laughs> Moving right along, as they say, into the third uh, case and that is the Enquist case. <laughs> um, this is a Roberts opinion, seven to three, with Stevens, Souter, and Ginsburg uh, dissenting. Just by way of background, uh, most of you know a little something about equal protection and therefore know that most equal protection claims are based upon being a member of a class, race, sex, sexual orientation, and the like. Um, most of you may not know that there is such a thing as a class of one equal protection claim where the government treats you uh, differently 
because uh, for arbitrary and capricious reasons. Often it's because uh, there's something vindictive or hostile uh, going on between you and the relevant government official. The Supreme Court held in 2000 that there is a class of one equal protection claim possible uh, in connection with uh, <coughs> regulatory action by government. That was a zoning case. That's actually out of the Seventh uh, Circuit. Here is the question in the Enquist case, a very important real world case. Does the, uh, the Village of Willowbrook case, the one that held there is such a thing as a class of one equal protection claim, does it apply to public employment? The Supreme Court answered no. It does not. In this particular case, the employee alleged arbitrary treatment, treatment in connection with her being laid off from the Oregon Department of Agriculture. She claimed that she was laid off vindictively. The Supreme Court said it doesn't matter. Here, you're dealing with the government as an employer and not as a regulator, and the government's discretion should not be unduly second-guessed judicially in the employment setting. This is not a case, in other words, where the government acts as a sovereign. For those of you uh, who know a little bit about public employee free speech and have heard about the Pickering line of cases as modified dramatically by Garcetti uh, in the public <coughs> employee free speech setting, uh, you see that the same movement is going on here. In Garcetti, the Supreme Court said when a public employee speaks as part of his or her job responsibilities, the First Amendment doesn't protect that employee at all from adverse employment action. At all. Because the, the employee is that, not a citizen. So it carved out an exception to the First Amendment. Here, the United States Supreme Court has carved out an exception to generally applicable equal protection analysis, which is constitutional, and said it doesn't apply uh, in the public employee setting where a, an employee wants to bring a class of one equal protection claim. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Stevens, Souter, and Ginsburg dissented. What they said was that Section 1983, this very important federal civil rights statute that creates provides a damages remedy for constitutional violations against state and local government officials. Uh, the, the dissenter said basically what, this, what the majority has done is cut back on the scope of this, uh, this kind of damages remedy by cutting back on the scope of the underlying equal protection claim. And uh, as they pointed out, uh, the court used a meat ax instead of a scalpel. Next case, voting. In this case, reflecting what I will describe as a uh, remarkable split among the justices, there is no opinion for the court. Get this line up now. Justice Stevens uh, wrote the uh, uh, opinion for three justices. He handed down the judgment, in other words, for himself, for Chief Justice Roberts, and for Justice Kennedy. And Justice Scalia, joined by Thomas and Alito, concurred in the judgment, and Souter, Ginsburg, and Breyer dissented. Many of you will remember, just by way of background, that the Supreme Court has held since the late 50s and 60s in voting rights cases that when government imposes burdens on voting in state and local government elections, strict scrutiny is ordinarily triggered because of the importance of the, the right. It's not a substantive constitutional right, but it's a fundamental right uh, or fundamental interest, however you want to describe it. Here, our next door neighbor, uh, Indiana, enacted a statute requiring citizens who voted in person to present a government-issued photo ID in order to vote. Now, there were uh, various exceptions, including those, uh, some for people living in nursing homes, but there's a generally applicable requirement subject to those relatively minor exceptions. And the statute also provided ways 
uh, for people to obtain a photo ID. Democrats and the elderly, disabled persons, poor persons, and minorities, as all as plaintiffs, facially, that's important, facially challenged this statute as unconstitutional because it improperly burdened the right to vote. Supreme Court held, uh, in this uh, opinion, if you will, by Justice uh, uh, Stevens for three justices, the Supreme Court determined that the statute was constitutional because the burden on voters was offset by a concern with fraud. The record here was not sufficient, according to the court, to offset, uh, rather to support, a facial attack on the statute. Unlike the poll tax, and there was that famous Harper case decades ago, this was a situation in which the justification was related to voter qualifications. Justice Stevens, for himself and the two others, engaged in a balancing act and said that the interest in deterring and detecting voter fraud, even though there was no such evidence in the record at all in Indiana, uh, and the interest in orderly administration and accurate record keeping and in voter confidence and the availability of free photo IDs, all of that outweighed the claimed a burden on voting. So that, in a very real sense, according to uh, a majority of the court, the challengers didn't satisfy their heavy burden of justification. Alleging political motives, because it was a Republican legislature that did this, alleging political motives, according to the majority, was not enough. Scalia Thomas and Alito concurred in the judgment, and most of you know that when you concur in the judgment, you don't join an opinion, you just agree with the uh, result. They said here the burden is minimal and justified, and here is the point of dispute in this case, really. Disparate impact on voting is not enough in an equal protection setting to trigger any kind of heightened scrutiny. That's what the fight is really about. It's about the level of scrutiny. Okay. Souter and Ginsburg, as I say, dissented. The burden uh, here uh, was significant, and it was unconstitutional under the Balancing Act, the statute was. And Breyer dissented as well, arguing that there was a disproportionate burden. So just to back up, this is a fight not only about voting in particular, but it's about the standard of review that we use in cases where voting in state and local government <coughs> elections uh, is burdened. Interesting question. This is pure speculation. Don't quote me. I'll deny I said it. Why did Justice Stevens uh, write this opinion, uh, the court's judgment, joined by Roberts and Kennedy, because I wonder if he wasn't worried that if he hadn't done that, you would have had five justices, uh, you know, the, uh, we've got Scalia and Thomas and Alito, who concurred in the judgment. They might have been joined by Roberts and Kennedy, and all three of the other eliminated uh, the heightened scrutiny in these kinds of cases. That's pure uh, speculation, but a fascinating case. <laughs> The only uh, kind of statutory non-constitutional case uh, today uh, is the CBOCS West uh, versus Humphreys case. And I want to say a little bit uh, about that by giving you some background. And this is a Breyer opinion, 72, 7 to 2, uh, and Thomas and Scalia dissented in this one. There are several very important Reconstruction era federal civil rights statutes. I've mentioned Section 1983 already. There's also Section 1985-3 that deals with racially motivated conspiracies. But there are two other very important federal civil rights statutes that don't get that much attention. Sections 1981 and 1982. 
1981 in particular, which is a statute we are primarily concerned about, prohibits, get this now, private racial discrimination in the making uh, and enforcement of contracts. Private, because it's enacted under Section 2 of the 13th Amendment. It's not a 14th Amendment, Section 5 statute, so there's no state action uh, requirement. Question about the scope of Section 1981. Does it cover retaliation against a person who complains about the violation of someone else's Section 1983, 1981 rights? I'll say that again. Does Section 1981 cover retaliation against the person who complains uh, about private discrimin racial discrimination against a third person? And the Supreme Court uh, held that it does. In this particular case, the assistant manager of a Cracker Barrel was dismissed <coughs> because he complained about the dismissal of another assistant manager on the ground that, uh, that he was black. Supreme Court ruled uh, primarily on the basis of stare decisis that yes, 1981 covers retaliation. And it did so because of another uh, not well known case, uh, except to those of us who follow this area, going way back to 1969, the Sullivan case, which involves Section 1982, also private racial discrimination. This one, though, with regard to the ownership of property. Section 1983 makes it a federal, uh, it makes it a violation of federal law to engage in private racial discrimination in connection with the purchase and sale of real estate. That decision, uh, the Sullivan case in 1969, had held that 1982 applied retaliation and since 1981 and 1982 have always been interpreted in tandem that's why uh, in this particular case based upon stare decisis this was uh, retaliation was covered some of you who do uh, statutory uh, civil rights uh, probably know that this is not an unusual kind of decision title IX, which deals with uh, sex discrimination in entities that receive federal funds, uh, Title IX applies to retaliation as well. The Supreme Court so held in the Jackson case in 2005. The dissenters, so the majority didn't have a serious problem with this, uh, but Thomas and Scalia did. They argued that there was a major difference between discrimination based upon status and discrimination uh, uh, and retaliation, I should say, based upon status, and retaliation based upon uh, conduct. Let me move on to the next case. We okay with time, Julia? Okay. I don't know how much uh, international law you folks know. Uh, I know, and I confess this with a great deal of shame, I know all too little about it. But I think as time goes on, whether we want to or not, we're going to have to acknowledge the tremendous influence of international law uh, on our lives. Because the case I'm going to talk about now, the Medellin case, deals with the potential internationalization of domestic law, including criminal law and perhaps even my favorite statute, Section 1983. More about that later. Let me give you the background in the uh, Medellin case. And by the way, this is a Roberts opinion. It's 5, 1, and 3. It's Justice Stevens who concurred in the judgment with Breyer, Souter, and Ginsburg uh, dissenting. This is somewhat convoluted procedurally and factually, so stick with me on it. Background is the follows as following. Uh, the International Court of Justice was established pursuant to the United Nations Charter, and it adjudicates disputes between member states. The ICJ held some years back that uh, in a case brought by Mexico against the United States, 51 Mexican nationals were entitled to review and reconsideration of their state court 
criminal convictions and sentences in the United States because of violations of the Vienna Convention on Consular Relations, which provides for notification to a consular post by a receiving state where a person detained so requests it. You get the scenario. You're a, a, a foreign national. You're prosecuted here. You have a right to consular uh, notification. <laughs> the International Court of Justice held that this applies, that its decision applies even where there is forfeiture on the United States law because a criminal defendant failed to raise such claims early enough in the criminal proceedings. Now, in this particular case, the defendant, Medellin, was convicted and sentenced in, sentenced in Texas for murder. <clears throat> he never raised his right to consular notification in a timely fashion. So under Texas law, he forfeited it. On the other hand, the International Court of Justice decision included Medellin as one of the 51 Mexican nationals entitled to uh, relief. So what happens here to the International Court of Justice's judgment? Is it applicable in the United States court? The Supreme Court held, as I say, it's a Roberts opinion, 513, that the International Court of Justice's judgment was not directly enforceable federal law, was not directly enforceable federal law preempting state limitations on filing successive habeas corpus petitions. Just to remind you, the Constitution provides that it Federal law and treaties are the supreme law of the land. The background here also includes the supremacy clause of the Constitution. So the judgment of the ICJ was not directly enforceable, nor was President Bush's memorandum to the effect that the United States would discharge its uh, international obligations by having state courts give effect to the ICJ decision. <laughs> Here's how Justice, uh, Chief Justice Roberts uh, reasoned for the court. The judgment is binding for international law purposes, but it does not have automatic domestic legal effect in state and federal courts. Because the treaty submitting to ICJ jurisdiction was not self-executing as domestic law, and moreover, there was no federal legislation. In other words, Congress did not enact legislation making ICJ judgments binding on state and federal courts. In other words, there was no implementing legislation. The Supreme Court looked at the text of the treaty in particular and post-ratification understanding by signatory nations to this optional protocol, and they said there's nothing automatic about the uh, enforcement in state and federal courts in the United States of ICJ judgments. Instead, we have to proceed by on a treaty by treaty approach. The court avoided the question of whether the underlying treaty for consular notification uh, was self executing What about the president's memorandum? Because in this case, uh, the president said, hey, we man that state courts enforce the ICJ judgment. Those of you who are separation of powers buffs uh, will appreciate this because the Supreme Court said that there is no executive power to convert a non-self-executing treaty into a self-executing one. This power belongs to Congress, and Congress has not acquiesced. Now, there were uh, various, uh, there was one concurring in the judgment decision, and then Breyer, Souter, and Ginsburg dissented. And they said, really, uh, this case is all about presumptions. Which way uh, should a presumption go? And the dissenters said the majority uh, improperly made the presumption as follows. 
there is a presumption against self-executing. And the center said there ought to be a presumption in favor of self-executing, which would provide a great deal uh, of predictability uh, to uh, international law and to what uh, different countries were doing. Notice, and uh, I'll finish the discussion of this particular case with this observation, notice the significance of this decision. It is not only significant in connection with uh, criminal law and criminal procedure, but it turns out that that federal civil rights statute that I mentioned, Section 1983, allows for damages actions based upon uh, treaties violations as well. And in fact, I did mention that the Supreme Court in the Medellin case did, left open the question of whether the Vienna Convention on Consular Relations is self-executing or not. There is a split in the circuits on that very issue. The Seventh Circuit says it is enforceable and two other circuits have said it is not. So this thing is going up to the Supreme Court uh, shortly. <laughs> or eventually. Let me uh, quickly go through uh, the last case that was actually decided, then say a word or two about uh, the case that's currently pending. Habeas, the war against terrorism, the Boumediene case. And we need to know this not because we're going to become experts on habeas, I don't know too many people who are experts on habeas, but for our general education as citizens and as lawyers uh, to be. Let me give you a little bit of background. In 2004, the United States Supreme Court held in Hamdi that uh, the authorization to use military force, this was after 9-11, authorized the president to detain persons who were determined to be enemy combatants. And uh, it also authorized the setting up of CSRTs, Combatant Status Review Tribunals, to determine whether persons held at Guantanamo Bay were, in fact, enemy combatants. In 2002, two years before Hamdi, the Supreme Court held in Russell uh, that federal statutory habeas corpus, federal statutory habeas corpus extended to Guantanamo. The Hamdan case, 2006, held that the Detainee Treatment Act of 2005, which deprived federal courts of habeas jurisdiction, did not apply to pending cases. And there were many pending cases from the Guantanamo detainees. You need to know that to see where this is going. Then the Detainee Treatment Act was enacted, was amended by Congress to expressly apply to such cases in the Military Commissions Act of 2006. So here is the question. Are the procedures in the Detainee Treatment Act uh, an adequate substitute for habeas corpus pursuant to the suspension clause of the Constitution? Article 1, Section 9, Clause 2, which provides no suspension of habeas by Congress unless uh, when in cases of rebellion or invasion the public safety may require it. <laughs> In this case, a major decision, five to four, Kennedy opinion, he wrote the majority opinion, uh, with Roberts, Thomas, Scalia, and Alito dissenting, held in fact that the Military Commissions Act of 2006 violated the suspension clause. And it pointed out uh, that while earlier cases may have dealt with federal statutory habeas corpus, here we are dealing with constitutional habeas corpus. And in order for the constitutional writ of habeas corpus to be suspended, it's got to be suspended under the appropriate circumstances, and there have got to be adequate substitute procedures for it. And for reasons that we don't have time to get into in great detail here, the Supreme Court said that the procedures that the CSRTs were following 
were woefully inadequate, no real opportunity to know all the evidence against you, no opportunity to confront and cross-examine. Cross Even the district court, uh, the circuit court of the District of Columbia, which had a review, uh, that did not save it because that review was very severely limited indeed. The scope of review by the uh, Circuit Court of Appeals of the District of Columbia was incredibly uh, narrow. So that the MCA was unconstitutional. This was another uh, remarkable uh, historical slash originalist decision because the justices on all sides went very deeply into history. The framers, the centrality uh, for the framers of abuse of monarchical power. What is particularly interesting for us about this case, well, there are many things, but what's particularly interesting for us is the way Justice Kennedy said there is indeed, uh, according to the framers, some extraterritorial impact of constitutional habeas corpus, where the government actually has almost complete control of the property, even if it's outside the bonds, the bounds of the United States. And the court pointed to Puerto Rico, uh, Guam, and previously the Philippines as examples of places where habeas, uh, constitutional habeas, would extend. Uh, it's worth it, I think, pointing out what the, excuse me, what the uh, dissenters had to say, in particular Scalia. But Roberts wrote the major dissenting opinion here, and he said, he complained, that the court was providing a set of procedural protections for aliens held as enemy combatant, combatants. And the court really should have abstained until, excuse me, until the combatants, the challengers here, exhausted all of their judicial remedies under the CSRT and uh, through the District of Columbia Court of Appeals because their constitutional claims may very well have been vindicated and they may have been provided relief. Scalia had, in some ways, the most interesting uh, opinion. He said, basically, habeas doesn't extend to aliens abroad, so the suspension clause had no application here at all. And finally, he said, America is at war with radical uh, Islamists. This may very well lead to deaths uh, of Americans, and this uh, decision by the majority reflected an inflated notion of judicial uh, supremacy. Very interesting indeed, particularly for Justice Scalia, uh, to make that observation. Let me, should I do the Summum case or go right into uh, questions? The Summum case is not a case that's been handed down yet. It is pending. So should I do it in two minutes? Or would you, let's open it up. What do you think? Should we open it up to questions? They're telling me to do the last case. OK, let me do the last case. And I'll hang around afterwards. People may have to leave. But let's be, I will be uncharacteristically flexible about it. <laughs> How's that? Let me tell you about this fascinating case. You should know that there have been uh, four to six or maybe more major decisions already handed down this term. There have been three major Section 1983 decisions handed down. For those of you who are into criminal procedure, you know the Supreme Court has taken a, uh, what may be viewed as a major step in uh, undermining the exclusionary rule in the Herring case. I'm not talking about those. Uh, no time. I'll tell you about another fascinating case, which I know is going to generate uh, various opinions, not unanimous. Under conventional free speech doctrine, the government is severely limited in the regulation of speech in what we call traditional public forums, such as parks and streets. We citizens have a right of access to such forums, and any regulation by government is subject to strict scrutiny. To put it another way, government is not allowed to engage in not only content discrimination, not only viewpoint discrimination, but content discrimination in a public forum. That's one aspect of free speech doctrine that you need to keep in mind. 
Another aspect of free speech doctrine, which is probably less familiar to, to many of you, and certainly a lot of lawyers don't know about it, is something called the government speech doctrine. Government engages in speech all the time. In fact, what is legislation if not speech? Supreme Court has told us that government speech, which involves the government as a participant in the marketplace of ideas, but not as a regulator of the marketplace of ideas, government speech is not covered by the First Amendment at all. Government can speak as much as it wants. Uh, I suppose one limit would be where government speech crowds out private speech, but we have not had a Supreme Court case uh, along those lines. All right, here is, uh, oh, one exception to the government speech doctrine that I want to alert you to is one kind of particular speech that government is not allowed to engage in is religious speech by virtue of the Establishment Clause, okay? Hold those thoughts, as somebody once said. Here's what happened in the Summum case. And this was a case that was uh, mooted a while back here, wasn't it? It was a moot court society uh, case. A Utah city in the early 1970s had accepted a Ten Commandments monument in a public park. And this had been placed uh, alongside uh, a number of buildings, artifacts, and permanent displays relating to the city's pioneer history. I say, way in the, in the early 1970s, actually 1971, donated by the Fraternal Order of Eagles. A few years ago, a group, uh, a non-mainstream religion called Summum, S-U-M-M-U-M, -M -M, wanted to uh, donate a monument to the city which had its key principles, its key religious principles. I forget how many, six or seven? Somebody knows? Seven. 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 Okay, seven's a magic number, isn't it? Okay. And the city said no because uh, that monument did not satisfy the city's historical relevance criterion. And you know what disappointed groups and people do in the society? So, and they went to federal court and they argued this violated the First Amendment because a park, and remember this isn't a park, was, it is a public forum and government cannot discriminate on the basis either of viewpoint, our viewpoint is this sum of religion, or on the basis of content. You can't discriminate against a religious subject, if you will. Well, the question is whether this park is a traditional public forum or is instead a non-public forum in which government uh, may not discriminate perhaps on the basis of viewpoint, but might on the basis of content, or is this a government speech case? Is the government itself speaking in this particular situation? The Tenth Circuit held that the refusal of the city violated the First Amendment because the park was a traditional public forum and the summer monument had to be included. There was a very interesting concurrence and, and dissent from denial of end bank review here. One of them, one of those opinions by Judge McConnell, formerly University of Chicago law professor who did some seminal writing on the religion clauses, uh, is now on the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals, highly regarded, one of those judges who was on the short list of appointees to the Supreme Court during the Bush administration. Very highly regarded indeed, like Judge Posner here. Everybody pays attention to what he has to say. He argued, Judge McConnell argued, 
that this was a government speech case because the city did not invite citizens to erect monuments in the park. Everything in the park was an expression of government speech. Judge Tasha, T-A-C-H-A, responded in a concurrence, and she had written the majority, the, the panel opinion. She said that the government uh, doesn't speak just because it owns the physical object that conveys the speech. What is crucial is whether government controls the message, and government didn't control the message in those earlier uh, settings. That's the issue currently before the Supreme Court. And lurking in the background, which hasn't been mentioned much at all, is the Establishment Clause issue, whether the Summer Monument violates the Establishment Clause. And probably that's only in the background because the Supreme Court held in the Van Orden case some years back that the Ten Commandments, when, it, when they are part of uh, an overall historical display, those were state capital grounds in the Van Orden case, those do not violate the Establishment Clause. So it's going to be very interesting to see what happens because you have a clash of rules in this particular case. Uh, and my guess is there's going to be some sort of narrow decision here. Perhaps the court in favor, uh, if you will, of I think the court's going to exclude the sum of monument. That's my guess. Don't hold me to it. And they're going to argue on the, on the basis of a kind of history museum analogy here. We shall see. Well, OK. A uh, few minutes over, but there you have it. And that's a mouthful. Questions, comments, observations, thank you. <laughs> Julia, I'll let you handle the, the questions available for a few minutes. And if there aren't any, that means I've answered all of your questions and solved all of your problems. Go ahead. Professor Goldhar. Uh, whistleblowers uh, in the public sector have lost a great deal of protection through that Garcetti case. If I work, let, oh, this is, this is more than chipping away. Uh, specifically, in that Garcetti case, suppose you have, uh, a, with respect to the Garcetti case, suppose you have a situation in which you are a police officer who is aware of rampant corruption in the department. And what you do, instead of going public with it, is report it to your super superiors, your supervisors. And you are thereafter fired for doing so even though this is clearly a matter of public concern. The Supreme Court held in Garcetti that you are not entitled to any free speech protection whatever. Any of your, it's a major decision, your only remedies would be under state and local law and perhaps under collective bargaining. And that's the equivalent to uh, what the court did in this class of one situation. I would actually say that Garcetti is worse than this because Garcetti is free speech, equal protection. Uh, that's fairly narrow in scope anyway. It's very difficult, even if you had a class of one equal protection claim, very difficult to show that you were treated uh, significantly differently for invidious reasons in comparison to people who are similarly situated. Does that help or is that too long of an answer? Uh, another excellent question. I just wrote an article about that. The problem, one of the problems with Garcetti is that it applies to all public employees, including mm -hmm. elementary and secondary teachers, college teachers, and beyond. And keep in mind what is job-related speech. It includes not only what goes on in the classroom, but scholarship is job-related speech. So if Garcetti is taking, taken literally, and I've argued that it doesn't and shouldn't apply in this latter setting, uh, 
then it means that there is no free speech protection at all here. I don't think that's what's going to happen. Uh, but it might make it much more important for academics to have tenure, uh, to have various contractual protections. So that's a, it's a remarkable uh, decision. And for those of us who are big on free speech, uh, Garcetti is very distressing because the court didn't have to do that. But this was the subject of my talk two years ago, not now. That may be it. Thank you so very much. <laughs>